A pleasant morning to all the participants of this one-day national webinar on folk narratives from the past into the future. Let us embark today's session with a prayer song.
small cheer and great welcome marks a merry beginning. I invite Dr. Albi Grace, head of the department, to deliver the welcome address. Morning greetings to you all. Folklore, legends, myths, and fairy tales have followed childhood through the ages. For every healthy youngster has a wholesome and instinctive love for stories, fantastic, marvelous, and manifestly unreal. On the outset, with warmth and immense pleasure, I welcome all the participants of this national webinar on folk narrators from the past and into the future. Next, I welcome our secretary, Dr. Sister Gerard J.M., Dr. Sister Sophie, our principal, Dr. Sister Lima Rose, vice principal, and Dr. Vinolia, controller of examinations. Next, it's my privilege to introduce and welcome Dr. Christopher Ramesh, the icon of the day, who enthusiastically has accepted our invitation to be the presenter of this webinar. He has served as the senior lecturer, professor, and head of various reputed institutions of Tamil Nadu, and has presented and published several papers in both national and international journals. He is a trained soft skills trainer and also possesses Cambridge University's highest certificate of proficiency in English. He is a theater artist who has manifested his expertise in direction, acting, costume design, makeup, and lighting. He is also an active member of the Undergraduate Board of Studies, Department of English, MK University, and SN College, Madurai. At present, he is the Assistant Professor of English, Government Arts College, Madurai. On behalf of the faculty of the Department of English, I accord you a warm welcome, sir. Once again, I welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you for your welcome. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your warm welcome. Being beautiful is not in the way you dress nor on the pigments you put in your face. Being beautiful is being simple. I invite Dr. Sister Ann Pepet sophie our principal, to give her felicitation. A pleasant good morning to everyone. I'm delighted to meet all the participants of today's webinar to this online platform. I'm glad that there are teaching faculty, research scholars, students, and others present now who have responded to our invitation with eagerness and interest. Hearty welcome to each one of you. Glad that we have in this webinar today participants from different states. Thanks a lot. The COVID-19 pandemic sweeping across the globe has its impact on all walks of life. It has created a new normal situation posing challenges. We need to accept and cope up with it with students. This situation has also created opportunities and opened avenues in different fields. We need to seize these chances and get back better. Res keeping this in mind, the PG and Research Department of English aided of our college is organizing this national webinar on folk narratives from the past into the future. Today, we have with us an eminent resource person, Dr. Christopher Ramesh, Assistant Professor of English, Government Arts College, Madurai, to give us an enriching session. Sir, on behalf of the management, staff and students of Holy Cross College Autonomous Nagakoil, I extend to you a warm welcome and invoke God's blessings on all your endeavors. I congratulate the faculty of the Department of English aided, particularly Dr. Albi Grace, the head of the department and convener of today's national webinar, and Mrs. Sadhana, the organizing secretary, 
for making effort to realize this day come true. At this juncture, I offer my warm felicitations, implore God's blessings for a fruitful webinar, and wish each one of you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you for your welcome. Over to Dr. Christopher Ramesh to enrich us with his insights in folk narratives. Thank you, madam. At the outset, I would like to thank the management, the members of the faculty of and participants of this webinar national level. They have given me this opportunity. You are also logging in your hour and net key problem are you going to Google, Google Meet? Uh, someone Google Meet mic is on kindly mute the mic. Google Meet online is having a problem. Thank you. Now I am glad to meet you all. This is a very YouTube person. Now it's the situation uh, we are living in. This is a very testing time for the entire world. Not alone. Please, my dear, uh, suffering along with us. So even amidst this, sir, apna switch off hai ki nahi hai ye mic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, kindly switch off. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Miss Rina Kumar, yes, thank you, thank you. So we have assembled here despite this uh, problem. And it shows that our commitment towards education and expanding our uh, academic boundaries we are what we normally do. What I'm going to discuss with you today is not something new or exotic. Not only students and teachers of literature, but the entire humanity knows this subject very well because um, stories, narratives, folk stories, these are all uh, very uh, in, in, integral part of human life, which has been there since the beginning of time, since humans came uh, to the earth, though we are all uh, the latest addition in the nature, the growth we have seen in the very short span of time it's really amazing and the uh, human growth is not just measured by materials and science and technology they are large civilizations are not judged by their buildings and uh, the wars they won they are also measured by the richness of their culture and one of the most prominent ingredients of indexes of their culture is their language, literature, and the narratives. Throughout the world, yeah. the antiquity of the culture is also measured by the antiquity of their literature. But often, we are at a loss when we try to find the source of certain stories. Because some stories uh, who source are unknown, but find their way to modern narratives, even in contemporary. <laughs> so we always wonder what would be the source of uh, these narratives, modern narratives. Where do all the stories come from? Do filmmakers, novelists, playwrights, artists, they invent stories? No, all stories come from some common sources and we are going to discuss the source of all the stories. Narratives or all narratives, the mother narratives. After my presentation is loaded, one of you please give me a feedback as to whether it is visible to you. Here you are. No, sir, it's not this. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, just a minute. It is loading. Okay. 
Okay. It's visible, sir. Okay. Thank you. Am I audible to you? Ah, yes, sir. Is my thank you. Right. So four narratives from the past into the future. So I believe the title itself makes a connection between the past and the future through folk narratives. It also indicates that folk narratives do not belong to the past. They pervade into the present and will pervade into the future as well. So it is a, a binding agent that transcends time and space. I welcome you to my presentation. Now there is a beloved place across all the time, across all the countries. No phrase in different languages, Danish, Dutch, uh, German, Chinese, Norwegian, narrative, Portuguese, Spanish, Swedish, are all Java, King, and they don't make any integral part of this human life. life is also familiar to us. Since the English time, so it was since humans, humans came, regional language from Mother to Earth, that beloved oh, phrase we are in English is there since the beginning yes. of time. Once so humans time. came, so uh, there is no the human being, though no, we are all what positively to this phrase. If we look back our life, our life has a considerable part spent on listening to stories how we were captivated by this phrase when our grandma and grandpa started telling this phrase. So, our uh, many years are filled with stories. Now, naturally, we have a question in mind. In the difficult survival situation, do stories play any significant role? Do we need stories? Is it not a luxury? But what in under Sasha says something interesting. According to him, the world is made of a linguistic reality. He says we understand the external reality only through language. If I had to convey something, I have to use a language, right? That even if it is a material. I have to use language to name that material. For example, if I say mango, if I say apple, if I say elephant, that are not physically present before you, still you are able to understand. You recognize what I say. So this is what Sasha says, that the world is made of linguistic reality. And here is also say the world is constructed on narratives. Yes, as I already pointed out, since the beginning of time, since the beginning of human beings, narratives have always played an important role, as important as hunting, gathering, and other survival activities. And uh, the narratives are uh, what we uh, see commonly call as stories. They were, as I said, they were needed for survival. They were essential to unite people. They display our ambition, people's ambition, rivalry, fear, respect, fantasy, wish fulfillment, entertainment, and education. Let us just look back. When we identify ourselves as Indians, or as Tamil people, or Keralites, or uh, uh, Biharites, or uh, Mumbai car, so, from such place, you would have come across some stories, narratives that give us some sense of identity, an Indian identity, a regional identity. And the stories also display India's ambition. During the freedom struggle, there were many stories and the slogans that, that demonstrated our ambition for a free India. And stories also show rivalry. During the struggle, the rivalry between the Indian freedom, British colonialism, the fear of oppression, the respect for arts, the respect for elders, 
find our interesting way of fantasizing things. Okay, during the freedom struggle, even before, a way before freedom was actually achieved, Tamil poet Bharviya composed a poem in celebration of freedom. Let us celebrate freedom. Let us celebrate freedom. And it is also kind of a national movement. So stories are not just for entertainment. They are educative as well. Now this idea is reinforced later by Philip Sidney in his essay, Apology for Poetry. He says, duty of the poetry is to teach and a delight. So in this way, the narrative has served an important uh, part of our life. And the narratives also serve a kind of an outlet, a creative outlet for expression of our fears and taboos too. Sometimes when we don't want to uh, do something or when we don't want our children and the later generation away from some evil practices, negative practices, the good thing is embedded in the story, right? They uh, say allegorically they create a kind of fear in the minds of young people to stay away from certain negative behaviors. And uh, as we already saw, that narratives have a functional purpose. They are functional for our personal growth. And science says that our cognitive growth, our mental growth, learning all these things, they are nurtured by stories. Stories play an important role in our growth and development. In addition to that, stories are integral to our culture. We live in a political world in India and elsewhere. So many places are German, are New Zealand, everywhere. And they also help social and spiritual growth. Social growth as we already discussed that civilizations are measured in terms of their uh, literary richness and uh, narrative richness and they also lead us to a kind of a spiritual growth when i say spiritual growth it is not limited to religious literature religion is one part of our spiritual life but beyond religion there is a metaphysical aspect of our life that is non-material aspect of our life which is also spiritual ethical moralistic for example for all these purposes narratives serve as an important tool so in every respect just like our food or technology narratives are also functional and important now let's focus our attention to the folk narratives. Folk narratives are considered mother of all narratives because all the modern narratives are derived or evolved from folk narratives. Roland Barthes, the important theorist in written response the uh, theory and uh, uh, post structuralism. He famously said about the death of author, okay? the death of the author. By this he means two things. One, once something is written down, the writer ceases to exist. The work the writer, becomes independent of the writer. Now, we may uh, see, uh, struggle to understand this concept when we deal with contemporary and live writers. But think of Shakespeare's plays. When we have Shakespeare's play, Shakespeare will not come to answer some of the questions, uh, the doubts the plays raise in our mind. We have to use our own interpretation. And this is one of the meanings of Bath's Death of the Author. The other meaning is all stories have their source in the unknown past. 
whose author remains unknown long ceased to exist okay so this is also the meaning of death of the author so in this way folk narratives are considered mother of all narratives and as we know already pre folk narratives are precursor to present literary fiction philosophy history politics and even science narratives okay even modern science drew its inspiration from lots of narratives lots of supernatural elements in the narratives from the fantasy in the narratives all the fantasies were converted into material form when they materialized they became science so in this way uh, folk narratives serve as precursor to all other narratives and they are prehistoric in nature they are very antique in nature but they are still relevant to the present some of the stories that were composed thousands of years ago they still have meaning today we cannot uh, dismiss those stories we cannot disconnect those stories from our contemporary experiences they are still relevant and the stories the folk stories were convenient to be explained or give answers to the mysteries of life and nature during the prehistoric time or in the ancient time when this a natural the phenomena work could right. not be understood by right. the ordinary people the writer they sought answers now, we may uh, uh, see I mean, start to understand this concept when we with contemporary live with some elders. I think of Shakespeare's plays. They provided a kind when of we have Shakespeare's plays. From modern science, this could sound archaic, but still, in those times, they offer some explanation. They were satisfactory. They were useful, and even now, they have extended meaning. they are not 100% archaic they still have extended meaning and folk narratives are, are a kind of a perception of life and the reality of people belonging to a particular culture particular ethnic group or a particular region or a particular time how they perceived life what was life to them how they understood reality all these things can be understood through folk narratives and uh, folk narratives combine both the natural and the supernatural elements because they could not understand and control many natural elements those natural elements were understood as supernatural characters supernatural elements and people started uh, revering them worshiping them respecting them so naturally the folk narratives are enriched with supernatural elements also and uh, uh, they serve as a bridge between in any household grandparents and grandchildren and grandparents tell stories grandchildren eagerly listen and this way there is a transcendental relationship between generation a kind of a bridge is built across generations between the past and the future so in this way folk narratives are still relevant now let us consider uh, the word origin so the word uh, though the idea is very old the term was coined recently has recently as 19th century by a german poet jochen gottfried herder he introduced the term He, in german he used the term folk dichten in german the the word sound is pronounced as first sound so this word mean folk literature or popular literature people noun popular adjective people's literature popular literature means and uh, we know that uh, we have a car a german car with a name Volkswagen, which we normally mis min mispronounce as Volkswagen, it is actually Volkswagen. People's carrier. That's the meaning. So folk means people. 
and the folk lore refers to the oral narratives people's oral narratives now these oral narratives are uh, pervasive everywhere they are found everywhere in every corner of the world in every part of our country in every part of our state our city or our village there are oral narratives the narratives told by grandparents and uh, these folk narratives are also uh, variously called as fable or parable or stories okay so this is the origin of the term folk narrative now folk narratives also have different genres uh, the broad uh, classifications are myths legends and folk tales folk tales also have fairy tales fairy tales are part of folk tales so i have not given a separate uh, identity to folk tales i mean folk uh, fairy tales now myths are the uh, most elemental folk narrative they are rich in symbolism and they set a context for human in the cosmos and they study the human relationship with the supernatural with the deities with prophets superheroes now we know from our experience and all years of experience, exposure to literature and the narratives myths are usually associated with religions myths are religious religious narratives postmodernism also calls myths as meta narratives or grand narratives they are elemental they use they are uh, in ancient and they evolved from the folk narrative they were enriched but they they were very powerful tools for religious unity cultural identity that is why they are rich in symbolism okay and uh, uh, they discussed the the context in which humans find their place in the entire cosmos and it, it studies the relationship with uh, the supernatural gods goddesses prophets superheroes now let us consider all other religious literature whichever faith you come from you just uh, think about your religious text religious knowledge you can understand this concept okay so myths or mythology is the study of myths is usually associated with religion and uh, uh, they are originally part of folk narratives and the uh, legends legends uh, are very interesting because they are not supernatural in nature they don't represent any supernatural characters they actually speak of real life characters but with some exaggerated uh, accounts of their actions and behavior okay? they are human centered they are not about gods or goddesses and like myths and uh, each locality will have their own legends usually fallen soldiers of a particular tribe some heroes a local hero in tamil nadu veera pandiya katta bomman a local um, a tribal leader a kind of a duke he has become a legend and his legend was used during freedom struggle to motivate the people to fight for for freedom so legends are found in all cultures in all languages in all religions so it is a mixture of history and imagination with exaggerated claims and they are related to a, a personal event okay of a person a celebrated person they are in simple format and in common language people's vernacular or local language colloquial language and when it comes to folk tales folk tales are self consciously fictitious the writers or the narrators very well know that it does not deal with any fact 
they want it to be fictitious for certain purposes because these stories are rich in allegory they are allegorical in nature now folk tales uh, have found their strong place in literature now they have been collected into a huge corpus by two persons first by a finnish scholar called anti ane and later by an american folklore scholar steve thompson now of course both were unrelated uh, see ane belonged to the 19th century and uh, uh, thompson belonged to the early 20th century but uh, thompson continued what ane had begun and uh, uh, because of their hard work we have a huge compilation of folk tales now these folk tales range from uh, the east and west hemispheres range between east and west hemispheres uh, folk tales from india from northwestern europe they have all been collected and compiled and they are also uh, classified into different types now these two writers two scholars have given some index numbers like our dewey decimal classification they have indexed they are classified and index all the folk tales based on the plots so the index ranges from 1 to 2499 approximately 2500 stories have been uh, collected and compiled under the title folk tales so this compilation is usually referred to as the a2 types or on a thompson index types so according to their index there are nine different types of folk tales like animal tales nearly 300 stories then ordinary folk tales then tales of magic then religious tales then novellas or romantic tales tales of stupid ogre see the ogre or jane stupid jane unintelligent but sometimes good natured uh, jane ogre like our cyclops or hulk in modern uh, comic fiction hulk then some uh, ogre characters we come across in harry potter uh, stories and movies so there are tales about stupid ogre then there are tales involving jokes and anecdotes anecdotes then formula tales formula tales are interesting because the end of the story the denouement okay usually involves a series of steps involved in uh, solving up the problem for example if you have watched or read harry potter stories uh, the story involves uh, the fight between harry potter uh, an upcoming wizard and a great uh, wizard but a villain voldemort so it's a fight between it's a clash between the good and the bad an archetypal story but when every time there is a problem harry potter tries to solve those who help him around are killed by some unforeseen or unseen force and slowly we come to know that harry potter is a carrier of one of the seven parts of voldemort's life this is difficult to understand in scientific terms but it is allegory right the villain voldemort has uh, to protect his life he does not want to be destroyed easily he wants to remain formidable so he divides his life into seven parts and he embeds each part of his life in uh, different places so harry potter and his friends and his associates those who are close to harry potter those who want to protect harry potter together they kill or destroy each part of voldemort's life and towards the end of 
the story we come to know the seventh part of life is embodied in harry potter himself so in this way there is a formula to kill to destroy the overcome the villain such type of story is called formula story uh, this is also famous in arabian uh, nights the sindbad story every time sindbad accomplishes accomplishes a mission that leads to another step in a mission or adventure even in tamil folk tales there are stories that usually involve yer kadal taandi yer mala taandi okay across seven oceans across seven mountains there is a, a secret place where uh, the wizard's uh, life is secluded or uh, safely uh, restored right so these are all the stories that are called formula tales and there are some unclassified tales also so these are the folk tales classified by et and nine titles based on the theme the most interesting uh, the highlight of folk tales are the animal tales i am not going to discuss all the nine plot structure just a few examples the most important being the animal tales so these animal tales involve animals or inanimate characters as actors animals we know in an image character for example recently in uh, children's uh, comic uh, cartoon animation characters uh, a new character an inanimate character is uh, gaining prominence minions for example so minions is actually a kind of sponge it doesn't have its own life it's an inanimate object given animation they have been uh, such characters are humanized so animal tales usually involve animal or inanimate characters as actors they are usually didactic in nature they give as some morals they teach us some morals or some lessons didactic and animal tales are known for their brevity brief they are very brief but they are effective in their philosophy or uh, didacticism and they are allegorical in nature and uh, these stories have certain advantages number one the animal allegory they are helpful in escaping criticism let's take a well known example from a modern narrative which is actually an extension of uh, say animal tales of the folk tales animal farm by george orwell we know we all know that it is actually a political satire george orwell had uh criticized uh see the after effect of um, uh, the communist revolution in so it okay he took sympathies for uh, uh, he developed sympathies for the founder of uh, the communism the idea like uh, karl marx karl marx come, comes as the old major old major character then uh, napoleon and snowball are allegorical characters representing joseph stalin and uh, lenin okay now animal characters are helpful in escaping the direct criticism through their allegorical nature so nobody can uh, find fault with george orwell for a direct criticism because the story is after all an animal story okay so only those who have the ability to in interpret and read into read between the lines to see the political nature of the discourse can understand this allegory and appreciate the true meaning so in this way uh, see the animal allegory is helpful in escaping criticism and uh, see the animal characters also represent some common traits human traits not animal traits human traits that are projected onto the animal characters and uh, these traits are also serve as common template okay, for the sake of brevity for example fox is associated with cunningness so if we have to represent 
a character, a human character, who is very cunning. Usually, we refer the character to a fox. Okay, fox-like character. Lion King. Lion is power, leadership, and king. In Tamil film song, there is an interesting song. Siyam bola naranthavara, chella parandi. My grandson is walking like a lion. Hey, it shows that he is a great hero. And mighty oak. And in India, mighty oak may have an equivalent in our banyan tree. Okay, reed. Reeds are flexible. So they shows the nature of humans that are flexible to escape the wrath of power. Okay. So in this way, the traits of these animals are inanimate characters as actors. Help us. Uh, represent some characteristics of humans. They help us uh, uh, use certain uh, weaknesses of human beings as templates. And uh, these characters also have some universal appeal. First of all, children like such animal stories very much. But uh, what we have as modern folk tales or modern version of the old folk tales are usually considered a refined or sophisticated version of the old versions because some of the original old versions are sexist or embarrassing in nature that are unfit for children okay they have lots of adult content and sometimes their morals are also controversy as teachers, scholars, students of literature, we know morals do not have static meaning. Morals are different in different uh, countries and different periods and different cultures. They are dynamic in nature. Sometimes the morals exposed by the folk tales are unacceptable to us. But still, folk tales have somehow the compilation of folk tales have refined and moderated all these limitations. And because of these reasons, the folk tales have some universal appeal. They are appreciated everywhere. And uh, these are some of the folk tales we are familiar with, apart from their modern versions in literature. Aesop's fables from Greece, the Panchatantra stories from India, the stories from New Testament and Old Testament survival, the fairy tales, Arabian Nights, and so on. So my entire presentation is not an exhaustive one. This is just an illustrative one. So you can do your own research to collect more information about folk tales and uh, uh, stories that are circulating for a long time across the world. Now. I told you that uh, stories, folk tales are universal appeal for certain reasons. So the reasons are these stories have lots of archetypes. They are archetypal in their motives. Motives we know when certain imagery or certain symbols are recurrent in nature, they become motives. So there are some motives that 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 have universal. Uh, meaning, for example, sea as a mysterious one, a challenging one, mountain or hills as a spiritual elevation. Somehow, in all cultures, gods usually station themselves atop hills and mountains, and humans uh, raise themselves to the level of the gods. They climb up the mountains and hills to witness gods. So this is a kind of a symbolic uh, elevation of our spiritual nature, right? So in this way, certain motives have universal nature, uh, then imagery, some universal imagery, just like I said, uh, uh, mountains and the sea. There are many images like darkness, light, darkness is usually associated with ignorance or fear or evil okay 
and the brightness is associated with illumination, enlightenment, knowledge, awareness, and symbols too. Okay, symbols too. Then a star is a symbol of guidance, sun is a symbol of life, and a moon is a symbol of uh, love and relationship. And there are many themes that are archetypal in nature too, which we shall examine in our in my later slides. And uh, the folk tales also hold so many psychological truths. Folk tales serve as wish fulfillment. Uh, see, many of our wishes we know we are familiar with uh, Freud's uh, theory of wish fulfillment fantasy, imagination, and dream states. So every folk tale is a kind of a wish fulfillment. And uh, the fantasy is actually a kind of uh, a, a tragic journey, a path towards wish fulfillment. For example, uh, Harry Potter, the modern Harry Potter. The writer of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling, was a destitute a single mother living in dirt poverty. She could not even uh, make three square meals every day. She lived in abject poverty. When she was very poor, when she could not fulfill even the basics of life, how many dreams she would have had about food, about comfortable life. If only she had a magic wand like Harry Potter. How many problems could have been solved? But she met with so many problems like Voldemort, unseen. Okay? Unseen. And the perpetual problems, every day. So many challenges she had to overcome. So this is, uh, Harry Potter is a kind of wish fulfillment. Uh, J.K. Rowling and the story is a fantastic story, fantasy. So in this way, folk tales also hold psychological truths. Uh, uh, see, the fairy tale like uh, Cinderella story. So this is a kind of a wish fulfilled from rags to riches. And folk tales also carry lots of cultural value in our, in our religions, in our moral judgments, we find lots of uh, role through, uh, we find lots of influence of our folk tales. Okay? Every religion has a set of folk tales, either in, as a meta narrative, like a myth, or uh, see in a local uh, folk tale, they have lots of uh, religious stories in the form of folk tales. And they carry lots of moral values. And they also demand consent. Consent means acceptance. When we become a part of our culture or any culture, our consent is important. See, the term culture itself is very controversial and also complex in meaning. The word culture is opposed to nature. Nature is free, wild, whereas independent, whereas culture is controlled. Culture is domesticated. Okay, agriculture, nature under our control for food production. Instead of collecting food or foraging food, we produce our food. So that is the beginning of control of nature. That is the beginning of culture. So culture means control. Culture means obedience, discipline, consent, acceptance to uh, obey the norms of a particular people. So religion, morality, they are demand discipline, obedience and consent from people uh, which become part of our culture. And folk tales also have political relevance. Usually folk, folk tales talk about power parity. The lion, two lion story, okay, the lion and the rabbit story, or uh, see the old uh, Tamil folk tale like an uh, uh, old lady making vadai, 
uh, being cheated by a crow okay who in turn is cheated by a fox now this story shows uh, the existence of power parity it shows the vulnerability of some people the party the old woman is vulnerable she doesn't have the power against people who are exploited you in nature okay so from this humble story to powerful uh, folk tales the stories involve political nature political characteristic because they show power parity they deal with power parity they show vulnerability of people they also involve identity of people okay ideology identity following up a certain culture or believing in certain narratives gives you identity and gives you political power so in this way folk tales also have lots of political value and folk tales are migratory in nature because people are migratory in nature so when people migrate stories also migrate and they take roots in different places from that place the old story with a new ending or a new twist they develop so stories migrate and they are scattered sometimes stories can also uh, come into being without each other's influence without knowing each other for example socrates idea of inquiry which we call as socratean inquiry okay which is the precursor to scientific temper asking questions like what why and how using logic and reasoning it has its parallel in tamil literature tirukkural okay proposed by tiruvalluvar eppurul yaar yaar vai ketinu appurul meipurul kaanvadu arivu when whatever you hear from from, from people whoever is the speaker you must be able to distinguish truth from falsehood that is intelligence according to tiruvalluvar you must be able to distinguish truth from falsehood that is intelligence meipurul kaanvadu i mean intelligence means reason employing your reason okay so none of them copied each other so this is a spontaneous generation because psychology says that human behavior is to a large extent uniform across the world because when the external stimuli are same the human responses would also be same in in terms of stimulus response okay there are some universal patterns in human behavior when narratives spring up from different parts of the world in different times without uh, being influenced by others such kind of uh, stories are called polygenetic stories poly means multi genesis we know source or birth so stories being born from different sources and some stories also travel when they travel to another rare place the stories took take a turn as i said through creativity the local people had their own version or local generations okay had their own interpretation and the story ends in a different way this nature of uh, the story is called a diffusion okay the story migrates but it it it, uh, it adds uh, to the uh, existing elements of the story and this character is called diffusion and uh, the stories are also folk tales are also evolutionary in nature they are adapted in the modern discourses modern narratives many stories can be found in modern form in modern even in modern movies we find many old stories okay in uh, 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 see hollywood many new films like avengers okay thor and other uh, fantastic stories they are adaptations of old stories for folk tales for example and in tamil film industry 
character Maniratnam, he adapted a Ramayana story, Mahabharata story. Mahabharata story became, was adapted into Tadabadi movie. Ramayana story was adapted into, uh, I, I forgot uh, the title, maybe you know that. Okay, and he also adapted the Bible story in a movie called Kadal. So in this way, stories are adapted by modern creators, filmmakers, novelists, storytellers, okay? That shows the evolutionary nature of the folk tales. And the folk tales, I told you that are rich in archetypes. So some of the well-known archetypes are uh, the archetypes of numbers. Some numbers are special. Some numbers are respected, particularly by faiths and religions across the world, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 12, and 30. So these numbers are usually revered and are respected as sacred numbers. So 1 usually refers to the Unitarian, the ultimate power. Okay? The Unitarian nature of God, for example, Unitarianism, Undre Kunam, Urvane, Devan. All people are one. God is one. Love is God. Okay, the binary. Right? With one being the prime number. And two usually refers to the duality or dichotomy in a mind. Dark, white, binary nature. Dark, white. Okay? Day and night, men, women, good, bad, nature, culture, right? And three is also a sacred number. Most of the religions have this trinity. In Hinduism, um, Hindu uh, scriptures talk about the holy trinity of gods, Brahma, Vishnu, Right? This holy trinity in God. The God of uh, creation, God of sustenance, and God of destruction. And in Christianity, Judeo-Christian traditions, the Jewish Christian traditions, trinity plays an important role. Okay, particularly in the Christian uh, trinity. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So in this way, trinity, the number three, plays an important role in our religion. It is a sacred number. And the four is actually uh, means a completion. This is also a sacred number. Okay, square. Usually the temples and the religious places, usually they have the square shape. And it shows, it indicates the four seasons, four stages in human life. And seven is also a sacred number. Almost all religions uh, celebrate seven as a sacred number, seven days. Okay, in Judeo Christian uh, tradition, seven indicates seven. in Hinduism, seven life. Every person is entitled to seven life. And similarly, 12 is also a sacred number, 12 months of a year. So there are 12 tribes in uh, the Jewish uh, uh, ethnic groups, right? Early Jewish people had 12 tribes. So somehow 12 also becomes a sacred number. In most of the countries, 13 is a number that is uh, looked upon as a kind of uh, an unlucky number, okay? They look upon the number with some kind of fear or uh, uh, uneasiness because 13 is an odd number. Okay, it is not divisible. So uh, in most of the cultures, 13 is looked down upon. Okay, 13 is fear. And there are many symbols, archetypal symbols, like triangle. Triangle represents, uh, uh, see the trinity, Okay, square, then six point star, circle, circle usually refers to the circle of life, circumference of earth. So the circulatory nature of 
paint. So circle is also an important symbol and color symbol, white piece, black uh, depth or uh, negative. Of course, the meaning of these colors are changing. Okay, post-structuralism does not accept archetypes because archetypes are considered structuralist in nature. So uh, post-structuralism deconstruction does not accept archetypes, but still meaning uh, undergo change, but still archetypally speaking, these colors have carried some standard meaning across time and space, white, black, green, fertility, red, danger, sacrifice, and so on. So some themes are also archetypal in nature. Okay, They are both polygenetic and diffusive in nature. Okay, They, are, they simultaneously originated or they migrated and took their own, their own modern forms. For example, there are parallels between Ramayana and Iliad. Sita, a young princess who's married to, for uh, her marriage, suit has come from many different countries. Okay, similarly, in Iliad, Helen is a princess, suit has come from different countries. And uh, they prove their metal by uh, doing some adventurous things. Then uh, both uh, Sita and uh, Helen are abducted. Then there is a war, a combined battle with uh, hundreds of ships and uh, thousands of soldiers who are crossing the uh, ocean, going across, right, and fighting on an island. So there are many parallels. Similarly, Mahabharata and the Exodus in the Bible has some parallels. In Mahabharata, Karnan is an immaculate conception. He is a son of immaculate conception, Karna. Fearing uh, the wrath of uh, parents and the royals, Pandi Devi puts Karna in a box and uh, he is sent afloat the river. And uh, later, she reunites with her son with a piece of her cloak. Similar story exists in Exodus. Moses. Then Pharaoh orders the execution of all the firstborn male children of the Jewish tribe. Moses' mother uh, does something similar. He puts him in a reed basket, uh, wrapped him in a, a cloak, and uh, he is sent afloat. And uh, Pharaoh's sister finds him, brings him up. He grows up in the palace as a prince, and later he rediscovers his mother. The story is slightly different, it ends in a different note that shows the diffusion nature of a migratory story. And Christ's birth and Krishna's birth also have some parallels. The kings of their time, they are afraid of uh, uh, a rival, okay, in the advent of either Christ or in Krishna. So they order slaughter. Once again, uh, Christ's family escape and they give him birth uh, in an undisclosed place. So uh, Christ escapes the wrath of King Herod. Similarly, Krishna's family is uh, put in the jail, put in the prison. So these stories, the similarities, the parallels show the archetypal nature, the uniform, the similarity in themes and the migratory uh, nature of the stories. And uh, let us see some interesting archetypal symbols as examples to reinforce my argument. Uh, just a few uh, due to want of time. See, these are the famous uh, pyramids of Giza. Pyramids are very special because of their symmetric triangle. This is a well-known fact. But this symmetric triangle is found in so many places with the same uh, reverence, with same kind of um, respect, okay, representing three and trinity and balance. See, look at the Mayan temple. It is also a kind of a triangle, okay, it looks like a pyramid. And our Hindu temple, some of the churches, right, that have cathedral roof and temples, they all have triangle, okay, that shows the triangles archetypal quality across time and space. 
and uh, look at the symbol of Hinduism, the interlocking inverted triangles. So two triangles are interlocked, inverted triangles are interlocked. So because of this, there are six points. When we draw uh, a freehand drawing of a star, we usually draw a star with five points, but here this star has six points. This refers to uh, six ideas of a religion, right? Two ideas, two, three, uh, two interlocking uh, triangles. Each triangle represents the trinity and two sets of triangles interlock and they convey some meaning. The same symbol can also be found in Israel's flag and in a Christian tradition, star, the six point star. In Israel, uh, Jewish culture and Israel, the flag, the star is called Star of David. Okay, David Meekan. So this is um, a powerful symbol in Jewish culture and Israel's history. Okay, and the Christians during Christmas, they decorate their houses with star because the star also shows the direction of the birth of uh, Jesus. So in this way, stars, the interlocking triangles made into star, they become powerful symbols across time and space. And this is a Jewish uh, candle stand, multi candle stand, okay? And uh, this is called Jewish, in Jewish culture, this is called a menorah. It is actually a symbol of life. It is called a tree of life. It represents, it symbolizes a tree. Okay, the tree is a tree of life. So tree has several branches. So your family starts from a single source and branches into different source. So tree of uh, life is a symbolic uh, idea in Jewish religion and in Churches also we can find such a multi branch candle stand. The same idea can also be found in our cookbook in Hindu culture. This is also called the tree of life. If you remember James Cameron's movie Avatar, the entire story revolves around a tree, a big tree, a giant tree, which is called tree of life. So these ideas are interrelated. Okay, they are archetypal symbols cutting across different cultures and religions. So these are some of the symbols as examples and stories are also migratory, I already told you. And uh, polygenesis, I already explained, when stories spring up from different places independently, that is polygenesis and diffusion means when the stories acquire their own version, their own twist, adaptation or creative there are polygenesis. The examples are Arabian Nights. Arabian Nights have traveled to many countries and there are different versions of Arabian Nights and uh, Iliad and Ramayana, I told you. Uh, though the stories have similarities, they have different endings and other narratives also, Christ Krishna birth, Arna Moses birth, and uh, the tales of the Jew Jewish tales from the Old Testament. They have traveled to different countries and uh, because Jews travel across the world, they carry the stories and stories they uh, also developed in their new places, in their adopted nations, and they were given a new twist. So in this way, stories also migrated. And this idea I pointed out, they have cultural values, religious and uh, identity values, and they have also become part of our popular culture. Okay, folk tales have taken new forms I we already discussed. Now they are part of TV soaps, TV serials, lots of uh, TV serials with mythological stories, children cartoon series, uh, Chota Bean, for example, okay, comic series. And uh, they also have become part of movies, modern movies and the political ideologies. And the stories are evolutionary, I pointed out. And uh, these stories are high in nature. So political ideologies use these stories with contemporary appeal. You can read any country and contemporary political history 
somehow these countries have the political ideologies. They also use narratives, particularly folk narratives and mythologies for uh, uniting people as a political tool to give people a common identity. And the story also evolves and you emerges with modern science fiction. Okay? When they acquire new forms, they also I, um, ironically become science fiction. For example, Moses' story can be found an equivalent in Superman. The Superman character was created by two Jewish uh, um, immigrants in the US. Okay, Jerry and Spiegel, they create. Now Superman is actually the son of a royalty in a distant planet. When there is a riot and when there is a, uh, an appraisal against the power, they put him in a space capsule and launch him. And he reaches uh, the Earth and he lands in a part of US and they are, he is adopted by an American uh, parents. Then he grows up into a super powered man and he becomes a messiah. He delivers people from he and the, the bad people. Just the way Moses delivered uh, his Jewish ancestors from uh, enslavement by pharaohs. Okay? And uh, Isaac Asimov's stories, science fiction, the foundation stories, they talk about galactic empires and the Spider-Man and Batman stories. They involve animal supernatural. And the, the films and stories like Avengers, they involve demigods like Thor, and they involve augurs, augur characters like Hulk, and James Cameron's Avatar involve Navi uh, tribe, okay, in a distant and unknown planet called Pandora. This Navi are a combination of humans and cat, plain humans. And Christopher Nolan's movie, Interstellar, it talks about migration, search for livable place. So migration, searching for greener pastures and related experience are favorite stories under diaspora literature. So this, is, this has been in existence for a long time, from the Jewish diaspora stories to modern stories. And Interstellar is about future search, future migration, when the, the earth becomes a state of nature, we go in search of other planets. Okay. So in this way, uh, the difference between folk and science fiction uh, blurs in the modern times. And uh, these stories become source of adaptation into modern stories or fantasy movies, as I pointed out. For example, X-Men series. In X-Men series, the, the more important characters are called mutants. Okay? Uh, the, the negative uh, result of genetic engineering, how when you uh, tamper with biotechnology, we produce a kind of different characters like uh, um, the Frankenstein. I think the way folk sto stories have evolved into modern science fiction. Now, let us have a quick glance at the science fiction and wind up. A look at the title of three science fiction stories, Starship Troopers. Now, when we talk about uh, space travel, a ship is not a term we often, we often use. We, use, we talk about it, uh, arcades, space shuttles, but here they talk about ship. So ship is a word from the past but it is used in, in the future part. Similarly, in the next one, a futuristic heroine is holding a sword. Now we have, we use guns, no swords. Now in futuristically, we may use laser guns, but she is still holding a sword. So there is a bridge between the past and the future. Similarly, in the next one, empire strikes back. Empires are terms of past, but futuristically also we talk about empires colonizing other planets which are the central theme in Isaac Asimov's foundation series and the science fiction is called speculative fiction because we speculate about an unknown future they involve usually science technology space and a night travel parallel universe extraterrestrial life 
and are ET, okay, aliens. And science fiction are also termed a literature of ideas or knowledge or science, but they are not new. They had their beginning in ancient time itself, and the line between myth and fact was blurred. And in the 22nd century uh, AD or CE, see the modern timeline is secular in nature. No more BC or AD, it is CE or BCE. BC becomes BCE and AD becomes CE. Common era before common era. Second century. You see itself, uh, uh, a Grecian writer Lucian, created a story called a true story, which is similar to modern science fiction, which travel to other world and you're meeting aliens and the space warfare. So in this way, uh, there is a crossover from science to humanities. There is a connection between science and humanities through science fiction. And the science fiction it came into being in Europe through Renaissance, scientific revolution, through the age of enlightenment. And there was an explosion of knowledge. Science fiction, even in, uh, see, romantic writing of the Elizabethan period, some science elements are uh, found in good numbers. For example, metaphysical. Metaphysical conceits. Compass, for example. Compass is a new uh, invention. Uh, it is a material, but uh, then uses compass the material to mean something metaphysical something physical to mean something metaphysical love between a husband and wife so they slowly pervaded into the modern time then we have francis bacon he wrote a kind of science fiction in a modern understanding that it was, that was a science fiction which is called a new atlantis then Jonathan Swift's Gulliver Trials, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Jules Verne's 20,000 uh, Leagues Under the Sea, H.G. Wells' Time Machine, Isaac Asimov's Foundation Series. These are all examples of European science fiction since the time of Renaissance. Now, there are some interesting uh, similarities between uh, folk tales and science fiction. Both are speculative in nature. Okay, in folk tales also, uh, animal stories, for example, they are speculative in nature. How, what if something happens like this? Okay, it is hypothetical in nature. Both stories are fantastic. They, they involve lots of fantasy. And if the folk tales talked about out of world experiences, the science fiction talks about intergalactic travel. Both are parallel. If the folk tales dealt with supernatural elements, uh, science fiction dealt with superhuman characters. And both are allegorical in nature. Uh, they mean something else. And both are criticisms of their present time. Right? Asimov's novels, 1984 by George Orwell, or Time Machine by H.G. Wells, they are criticism of their present times. If we find gods and goddesses in folk tales we find aliens or extraterrestrials in science fiction and folk tales come from the unknown past and science fiction lead us into the unknown future these are the striking similarities between folk tales and science fiction so in this way we understand that folk tales evolved into modern form and they and go into the future in the form of science fiction. There are few dissimilarities. Yes. Only the, the dissimilarities or differences are folk tales are based on belief, faith. Animals cannot talk. Okay, gods or goddesses cannot participate in our day-to-day -day affairs. Whereas science fiction is based on logic probability. Many things that were uh, part of fantasy and imagination in the past have now become fact. They are possible in the modern life. So it is based on logic. If folk tales are based on myth, science uh, fiction is based on facts. And if folk tales are religious in nature by and large, 
science fiction is invariably secular in nature. So these are some of the similarities. So I consulted two important books out, apart from in a range of other books, but two important books I refer to for the presentation. The first one is Folk and Fairy Tales, a handbook written by Dale Ashleyman, Greenwood Press, London, published in 2004. The other one is Anthropology, a Global Perspective, edited by Scoopin and Decores, published by Prentice Hall, India, New Delhi, 2005. So we have seen how folk stories originated along with humans and they traveled across time and place and they pervaded into our present and also slowly inching towards our future in the form of science fiction. They, they become a kind of fillers and they become I mean, master narratives or mother narratives of all our modern discourses. So literature cannot be understood without a, for, a formal understanding, without a good understanding of our folk tales. And folk tales also connect generations. And folk tales offer a rich uh, uh, opportunities for research and further studies. I invite research scholars to explore this area and learn more about uh, folk tales and the connection between folk tales and science fiction. And hope my presentation helped you understand this uh, topic to a certain extent. And as I told you earlier, this is not exhaustive, only illustrative. This is only a perspective, right? You can add your own perspective. And I wish you all a very best in your career, academics, and personal life. Thank you for your patient audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. My pleasure. Sir? Okay, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first question. Yes. Can you hear me, sir? Uh, first question yeah, by I Behar don't... Gandhi. Yeah. Yeah. As technical developments are happening yes. every day, what yeah. major changes can we see in folk tales today in comparison with the older ones? Yes, I already showed you some examples. For example, Christopher Nolan's Interstellar movie. Interstellar movie is an extension, is the modern form of our diaspora stories in search of the greener pastures. How conflict in one place leads to another place. The story of Superman, okay? How a person's perceived sense of victimization and slavery led to liberation of many other people, deliverance of other people uh, in Moses stories and also in Superman stories. And uh, Avatar, for example, the world is mercilessly exploited in the name of development, nature is destroyed. This is unacceptable to many uh, intellectuals. There is a huge uh, and a marked difference between those who favor development, material development, and those who want to preserve nature for the future generations. Okay, this clash is always there. So when Avatar was uh, released, this movie was banned in Soviet Union and China. If the story is full of fantasy and imagination, why did these countries ban the movie? Because somewhere, the allegorically, this story, this movie, okay, attack their policies, their behavior. So in this way, uh, see, uh, Avatar is actually an extension of uh, a folk tale, right? The animal folk tale, the, the supernatural, the extraterrestrial, okay? So folk tales, they slowly pervade into modern narrative and many creators have uh, made so many stories. The X-Men, for example, there, that is actually a warning about too much experiment, so much, too much tampering of genetic engineering and genetic science. And similarly, the last uh, world or uh, Jurassic Park, there's a beautiful dialogue in the movie. A mathematician, this uh, role was played by Jeff Goldman. 
he criticizes from the beginning he criticizes richard attenborough who comes as the uh, genetic engineering scientist commercial um, interest in science could lead to catastrophe so he says nature in the film here there's a future interesting dialogue in the mathematician says nature chose certain animals to be extinct any attempt to bring back those animals is a violation against nature he would say and we know the film how the film ends okay too much of technology cannot solve anything so unless we learn to live a sustainable life okay unless we stop tampering with nature nature will protect us and even our covid situation is an example of how our interference with nature's supply chain resulted in our break up a pandemic so in this way folk tales give us a forewarning they warn us about consequences right and modern movies are a kind of a repackaging old stories in new format that's all in the form of science fiction so they are still relevant in the present hope i answered your question okay thank you sir thank you. next question next question is uh, next question is from ramanan manu what yes. is your opinion of what is your opinion of retelling yes. of myths yeah well retelling of myths uh, as we discussed myths are also retold in many new forms i quoted two examples from film industry tamil film industry mani ratnam uh, retold uh, ramayana mahabharata bible in different forms okay as long as myths are not used uh, are not used for political advantages or uh, discriminate your uh, uh, violation of human rights or destruction of nature they are important for shaping up our moral values okay and creating ethical behavior they are relevant but it all depends upon how the story is interpreted and retold so it all depends upon uh, the narrators how the narrator repackages and retells the story what aspect of story is highlighted and with what purpose there was a film an interesting film fahrenheit 421 i believe that uh, denzel denzel washington now it is a post apocalyptic world it is the world whole world had become a uh, utopia uh, there were so many nuclear war and uh, people were are reduced to rubble with the basic uh, uh, this man the hero he is a good man he is trying to save your book because he believes that this book would be useful to unite people bring good people and reshape okay recreate the world okay uh, starting the so he is trying to protect the book at the same time some bad people the villain is also trying to uh, take the book he wants to possess the book because he believes with this book he can converge Uh, the faith of the people okay they he can unite the people by building a faith around this book and in this way he can manipulate book he can become powerful and exploit the world so one book right but two people try to possess the book for two different reasons one for positive and one for and that book is bible okay so religion and myth can be manipulated that is the message of the movie for what purpose somebody is using is a very political question so in this way myths are relevant but they it depends upon how myth is retold thank you thank you oh, sir next uh, next question is from ms jules jalaja uh, yeah. ravana who is seen as an anti hero in india yeah, yeah. Yes. is worshipped at, is worshipped at, in sri lanka how do you look at it right this shows uh, the migratory nature of the story as i already pointed out right the polygenesis and the diffusion 
So the, the diffusion point, when a story migrates, the diffusion uh, looks at the characters in, from different perspective. Each culture, uh, I also pointed out that how morals vary from culture to culture, from time to time. One man's uh, terrorist is another man's martyr. There is a famous saying. So in this way, each culture looks upon some characters as either uh, reverential characters or uh, demon, uh, demonic characters. It all depends upon cultures. Now, oh, as, as I pointed out in the case of myth, it all depends upon interpretation. Because folk tales, myths, these are all uh, rich in allegory and a symbolism. So the way we interpret make the meaning of the text. It all depends upon the reader response. Okay. It is perspective, it is subjective. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yeah. sir. Final question. Yes. It's from Yes. And rejecting many myths of the past. Now please repeat. Does now, this nowadays yeah. we see thinkers shattering and rejecting many myths of the past? Does okay. this in any way affect their relevance and authenticity? Once again, I think I already answered the question. It all depends upon how we interpret and for what purpose we are using these narratives. Now uh see myths try to uh, enforce a kind of ethics in our behavior okay yeah. love your neighbor as you would love yourself this is very simple vasudeva kurba yadu mure yavarum kele universal brotherhood respect of human rights so these are the bedrock of all religions all moral education and this is how myths are also constructed okay but myths are grand narratives there are so many elements in myths so the interpretation of myths in the hands of the readers reader response how you interpret how you deconstruct the writers construct the meaning readers deconstruct the meaning the meaning making according to Derrida is based on prior ideological commitment. What is your previous understanding of life? What is the sum total of your experiences? They will decide how you understand the text. So when it comes to literature, literature is a subject of interpretation. It is different from science because in science, meaning is binary. Okay, there is only black and white. Whereas in literature, every idea is a subject of interpretation. It's a matter of interpretation. There is no unitary meaning. It all depends upon how and for what purpose you read and understand. So in this context, myth is also a matter of interpretation and the understanding and the way you use myth is very, very subjective. Right? Because it is also psychological, oh. cultural, political, sociological, everything is there. So it is very subjective in nature. Hope I answered your question. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, now